Dueling Hearts Book 2, The Arrival of the Reaper, by John Kessling. Chapter 1, The Mysterious Arrival. In a suburb of the northeastern United States, on a poorly maintained street devoid of any other businesses, sat a lonely building roughly the size of a common corner mini mall. Between its textured windows and its yellowing siding, the sad little place didn't manage to draw much attention. Most of the people who saw the sign above the door didn't even notice what it said, let alone what it was advertising. These days, now that summer was coming to an end and the local mega dojo had opened in earnest, offering lessons and fighting to anyone who wanted it in a cheap and accessible way, even fewer people were interested in the services of a corner dojo like Wilson's Dojo, with its shabby appearance. While this didn't bode well for the viability of the business, it suited the one member of that dojo perfectly. Her name was Jo Zeger, a 15-year-old girl with messy, medium-length, dark brown hair and matching eyes. At 5'10", she was a bit above average in height compared to the other girls her age, but she didn't think much of that fact. Jo rarely paid mind to what people looked like, including herself. She cared far more about people's actions. In part because of this, Jo never bothered to dress herself up, her regular attire consisting mostly of shabby t-shirts, faded and ripped jeans, and a frayed black overshirt that she had had since she was a kid. This morning, however, Jo was dressed a little differently. She had chosen to forego the jeans and the t-shirt and even the shabby overshirt in exchange for a black sports bra, black sweats, and a white tank top that showed off the well-defined muscles in her arms whenever she moved. She often wore an outfit such as this when she was working out. In this case, she was trying to get in some early morning training before making her way to a prior engagement. This was not, however, like any kind of typical martial arts training. This was something special, something that, despite being 30 years old, despite having changed the world, was still mysterious to many people. Joe was not a typical fighter, but a soul fighter, someone trained to use the energy of soul which practically all people possess, to augment her abilities and compete in matches called heart-to-hearts. It was her dream to pursue competitive heart-to-hearts as a career one day. Add to that the fact that Joe was a naturally competitive person anyway, and it wasn't surprising that she typically found time each day to train herself to use her soul more effectively. Joe stood inside Wilson's dojo at one end of the spacious area used for lessons, facing the far end of the room where six training mats were propped up against the wall, measuring in total about 24 inches thick. Between Joe and the mats stood three foam torsos, made from proprietary materials that dissipated most of whatever energy was applied to them. Each torso was wearing a thick padded vest that covered its chest and abdomen, made of that same material, protecting it further. From her place at the other end of the room, Joe prepared to attack the foam torso at the back, not with her fists or her feet, but with soul itself. And she planned to go through the other two to do it. In preparation, she felt for the wild and chaotic sensation of her unique shadow soul within her, as well as the warm sensation of her life energy deep within her core, and she willed those energies to mix. The experience was intense and uncomfortable, and Jo had to struggle not to lose control and injure herself should the energies either increase too much or spring violently back apart. Mixing the two energies caused them to amplify one another, and Jo was able to seize hold of the new soul that was generated, wrapping herself in it. Miniature bolts of lightning lanced off of her body as that soul wrapped her up and turned into a churning aura of purple and black light, shaking the floor beneath her with its very presence. The entire process took only a fraction of a second. It was far from the most impressive aura that Joe had ever produced, but she'd never been able to make one so quickly before, and she wasn't finished yet. Just as the aura finished forming around her, Joe lifted her arms, holding her hands out in front of her, palms forward. Soul crackled its way down her arms and collected just beyond her palms, forming a swirling orb of pure soul that was roughly the size of a softball. It crackled with power, causing the air throughout the entire building to churn violently. Without hesitating, Joe drew back her hand, wound up, and made a throwing motion. The ball of soul followed the gesture, behaving as if it had been thrown. It spiraled toward the foam torso as fast as a bolt of lightning. When it struck its target, it bore through the vests and the foam torsos themselves and carried through, digging into the mats stacked behind them. It continued to bore deeper and deeper into the mats, but as it did, its rotation slowed and the orb itself became smaller and smaller until, finally, just before it would have come through the other side, it dissipated completely. Joe exhaled slowly, allowing her extra soul to dissipate just as the attack had. 
Her aura stopped turning so chaotically and then disappeared completely as Joe looked over all that she had accomplished. It wasn't bad for the weakest iteration of the attack that she could produce. Joe heard footsteps behind her, and a moment later, an elderly man in thick, horn-rimmed glasses emerged from an adjoining room. This was the Wilson of Wilson's dojo. That was rather impressive, Miss Seeger, he told his only student. You have managed to cut the time that it takes to manifest your soul breaker down by two-thirds. Joe, however, wasn't nearly as proud of what she'd managed to do. Frowning, she said, Yeah, but I still can't produce enough soul to make it at all without creating my aura first, and making an aura telegraphs that I plan to attack. Progress is still progress, Wilson asserted, and you must keep in mind that manifesting such a concentrated bolt of soul at your age, or at all, really, is impressive, regardless of how you have to go about it. Joe didn't say anything to that. She understood that Wilson was right, but she couldn't bring herself to admit it out loud. She wasn't thinking about her own growth as a fighter, at least not exclusively. Her mind was still, at least in part, where it had been for the last two months, ever since three extremely powerful and gifted soul fighters had come to town to challenge Joe and her friends to a death match in the name of their organization, the Soul Takers. Since they had last seen Karen, Monty, and Lawrence, Joe and her team, the Dueling Hearts, hadn't come under any danger, and yet Joe was still worried every day that they would return and challenge the Dueling Hearts for their souls a second time. Joe's friends were, finally, beginning to feel differently than Joe. Even Joe's best friend Tucker, who had been the most wary of the Soul Takers and their promise not to return, was starting to admit that it really didn't seem like they planned to go back on their word. Joe didn't really understand it. When Karen and her allies had gone, Joe had vouched for them. Why, now, was she beginning to doubt them? She simply couldn't articulate the answer. No, Joe thought, that isn't entirely true. Whenever she thought about it, Joe still trusted Karen, as unreasonable as it was. She had feelings for Karen, feelings that she hadn't quite come to terms with yet. A part of Joe was convinced that she only trusted Karen because of her feelings, and so she was overcompensating, going against her gut and forcing herself to remain wary. She acknowledged that, and yet she still felt that she had to pay her suspicions mind. She still felt that she had to prepare. Joe was a big enough person to admit, at least to herself, that she might be wrong about Karen, that she had misread the situation and her suspicions about Karen's motives were wrong. That was a risk that Joe simply couldn't take. The final heart-to-heart -heart between the Dueling Hearts and the Soul Takers had been a close fight. Tucker had almost died. If the Soul Takers attacked the Dueling Hearts again, they might not be so sporting the second time around. So Joe continued to train for that possibility. If the Soul Takers came back, Joe didn't want their next confrontation to be so harrowing. Yet Joe had to admit that even she couldn't worry all day every day. She had a life to live, after all. So she decided to take Wilson's compliments and move on with her day. Thanks, Will, she said, and then asked, Hey, you need help cleaning up my mess? I wouldn't mind it, Wilson told her, looking upon the destruction that she had caused with a crooked half-frown. But it's all right, I'll take care of it. You still have somewhere to be, after all. Joe frowned. She'd almost forgotten. Thanks for the reminder, she told her teacher. I gotta go, or I'm gonna be late. Without another word, Joe rushed to the corner of the room where she kept her gym bag, snatched it up, pulling out her old black overshirt and tossing it over her shoulder. Then, suddenly, she seemed to flicker out of existence, replaced by a streak of black and purple static. At the same moment, the front door of the dojo was thrown wide open, seemingly by nothing. None of this surprised Wilson. He had seen Joe use her shadow step enough times now that he expected it. Joe reappeared outside. Even as she appeared, she straightened her shabby overshirt, which had shifted into its proper place even as she moved. Then she disappeared again and didn't reappear anywhere close by. Now that she was outside and therefore had access to more deep, direct shadows than just her own, Joe could shadow step further, faster, and with less effort. Each time she passed into a new shadow, she flickered again, moving so quickly that even trained soul fighters would have had trouble keeping track of her. She could shadow step in any direction, but it was easier and she was able to shadow step further if she moved along a shadow's path, and so that's what she tried to do whenever she could. Doing so, she was able to cover several miles in just a few minutes. Joe finally flickered back into view in the middle of a worn back street. The pavement was riddled with potholes, and of the nearly one dozen small dilapidated houses lining it, nearly half of them were very obviously abandoned. Joe looked at one of the better kept houses, and she waited. She frowned when she heard yelling from inside, followed by a crash of breaking glass or ceramic. 
The front door swung open, and Joe's friend Tucker emerged, dressed in his own shabby workout clothes, his own bag draped over his shoulder. Yeah, yeah, Tucker said under his breath. Screw you two. Your dad giving you crap again? Joe inquired. When is he not? Tucker replied, frowning right back at her. He stopped next to Joe, showing off just how much taller he was than her, his spiked, fire-red hair beginning a full six inches above her head. He let out a deep sigh and smiled. It's fine, whatever. It's not like the jerk could hurt me, even if he wanted to. Joe had to admit that she couldn't argue with his logic. Anyway, Tucker said cheerfully, we have somewhere to be. He hiked his bag further up onto his shoulder, where it had begun to slide down his arm, flexing powerful muscles of his own beneath his freckled skin. His green eyes held a gleam of repressed sadness that only someone who knew him as well as Joe did would have noticed. We do, Joe agreed, and the two of them turned at once and began walking towards the nearest street corner and the bus stop located there. The two of them didn't have to wait long for the bus to arrive. And Joe and Tucker had been riding this bus line for so long at this point that they knew the schedule by heart. Despite the unpleasantness of the scene at his home, Tucker was as personable as ever, and so his conversation with Joe during the bus ride was a pleasant one. The two dueling hearts rode the bus for something like 20 minutes, finally arriving within the local town center near the mall. That was not their destination, however. Instead, they made their way across the expansive parking lot between the mall and another large building situated opposite it. Large block letters affixed to the front of this second building read, Procorp Mega Dojo. Waiting for Joe and Tucker near the front doors of the Mega Dojo were two other girls. One of them was a full two inches taller than Joe and just as powerful looking, though in a different kind of way. She wore black combat boots, purple leggings under a black lace skirt, and a skin-tight purple and gray striped long sleeve t-shirt beneath a see-through black top. Her hair cascaded down to her shoulders. It was mostly the same color as Joe's except for the bangs, which were dyed with streaks of purple and black. The second girl was much shorter than Joe, standing at only about five foot four. She wore a simple pair of sneakers, a pair of blue jean shorts, and a yellow t-shirt with the number nine on the left breast. Her bouncy, curly blonde hair was the perfect companion for her bright blue eyes. The darker haired of the two girls carried a bag much like Joe's, and both girls turned to meet Joe and Tucker as they approached. You ready for this? Uh, the blonde girl asked, uh, smirking derisively at Tucker. This was Joe's sister, Sarah a wolf in sheep's clothing story in human form. Her small frame and cute face hit a sharp tongue in a short fuse. Don't look at me like that, Tucker protested. You had a chance to fight today instead. If you didn't think I could win, you should have taken it. Oh, she's just giving you a hard time, the other girl said, rolling her eyes. She knows just as well as the rest of us how well you and I fight together. This was Joe and Sarah's cousin, the always rational Jen, who was undoubtedly the most tactically inclined of the dueling hearts capable of treating any fight like a puzzle. Yeah, Sarah admitted. Okay, I guess I'm just a little jealous. I know I said I didn't want to compete, but I am a little bummed out that I won't get to represent the team, especially with how my schedule turned out next week. It's all right, Joe assured her, reminded of the fact that Sarah's soccer team, the Golden Rods, had won their last game, ensuring that they would play again at the same time as the Dueling Hearts' next full team match. There will be plenty of chances for you to represent the Dueling Hearts, especially with the new Procorp deal. This, unfortunately, had the opposite effect of what Joe had wanted. Sarah's frown deepened. I'm still not super happy about that, she said, lamenting, not for the first time, that the Dueling Hearts were currently under contract, required to participate in a certain number of official events for the entire rest of the year, at least. What if you don't find a fifth fighter before next week and I have to miss a soccer game to participate? You won't miss your game, Joe promised. I already have two prospective members lined up. If both of them sign on with us, then we'll have a stand-in for you and a relief member. Really, Jen remarked with a knowing smile as the four fighters finally meandered their way into the large building. Any chance you'll just tell us who these two potential members are before you just show up with them one day? She asked. Nope, Joe replied with a broad, toothy smile. That wouldn't be any fun. Displaying different levels of annoyance with Joe, the other dueling hearts crossed the threshold into the mega dojo at her side. As they did, their conversation stopped. They had all been here multiple times now, and yet the sheer scale of this place was still stunning. It was a martial arts and soul dojo set up like a corporate super gym. To the right of the main entrance was a long curved desk staffed by pretty people ready to jump upon any prospective members and sell them the dream. Dance Dance Revolution-esque platforms, which promised to measure a person's soul, stood against the wall to the left, despite the fact that they didn't do what they promised nearly as well as a decent soul fighter could on their own. 
Along the right wall, beyond the desk, were juice bars and other health product stands. Workout mats lined the majority of the central floor, spaced so that moderately sized groups could walk between them. None of this, however, was of any relevance to the dueling arts today. They were here for the Mega Dojo's main attraction. The back third of the central floor was dominated by one thing. A huge arena, large enough for several people to fight on it at once, surrounded on three sides by arena-style seating. The fourth side of the arena, the one nearest the center of the room, was lined with circular tables on a raised platform, ringed with comfortable padded chairs. The changing rooms for members were to the left and the right of the seats along the back wall. This was the central feature of the Mega Dojo, and dozens of others just like it that would be open soon across the country. It was because of this arena that the famous tech giant, Prometheus Corporation, had built the Mega Dojo to begin with. It was state-of-the-art, designed to make heart-to-heart -heart safe to observe by turning the energy produced during heart-to-heart -heart into a barrier, capable of blocking stray soul from reaching the spectators. Do we know who we're fighting yet? Tucker asked Jen as he watched dozens of people file into the stands. Yeah, she replied, a couple of guys from a team called Team Haymaker. Never heard of them, Tucker said with a lopsided frown. Me neither, Jen agreed, but that doesn't mean we should take them lightly. Tucker rolled his eyes, but Jen ignored him, adding, I need to change. I'll be right out. Tucker walked with his hands in his pockets up to one of the four marked squares along the right side of the arena. Four identical squares were marked on the opposite side. Meanwhile, Joe and Sarah bought drinks, found a table with a good view of the arena, and they waited. Finally, after another several minutes, as the start of the doubles match drew near, people stopped piling into the stands. Jen came back out of the locker rooms, having exchanged her undershirt for a tank top and her boots for sneakers, and stood next to Tucker. A fit Latino man, who Joe knew as Eric, walked over to stand next to the referee's platform, which would rise up to the height of the arena shortly. Things seemed ready for the fight to begin, and yet the time for the start of the match came and then passed without anything happening. Joe and Sarah looked around, confused, and noticed the reason. Jen and Tucker were present on their side of the arena, but their opponents were not. Joe frowned. The spectators were beginning to murmur in confusion and frustration. Joe looked at Eric. He was talking frantically to one of the pretty women from the front desk. Finally, their conversation came to an abrupt end, and Eric forced a smile onto his face. He stepped up onto the referee platform, and it rose up into position. Distinguished spectators, he began pleasantly, it seems that we have a situation on our hands. As you can see, the two fighters from Team Haymaker have yet to arrive, and now it would seem that a note has been found at the front desk indicating that they have conceded this match to Jen and Tucker of Team Dueling Hearts. The murmurs of the crowd heightened, but Eric talked over them, quieting them. I apologize. I know that you were looking forward to seeing a heart-to-heart, -heart, but there's nothing we can do except call this match in favor of Team Dueling Hearts. He seemed like he had more to say, but this time it was the crowd that drowned him out. That's when Tucker decided to act. Whoa, he said as loudly as he could, leaping high up onto the arena floor, walking to the center and standing there beneath the bright, overhead stadium lights. Whoa, guys, calm down. You guys want to see a heart-to-heart? -heart? The spectators voiced their unanimous agreement. All right, then, Tucker continued, and Joe knew immediately where he was going with this. There are other soul fighters here. Instead of these haymaker dudes, me and Jen will take a challenge from somebody else. The crowd seemed excited by the prospect, and Eric was quick to voice his approval. So Joe looked to Sarah. She could tell that her sister was thinking the same thing she was. They both made the stand and volunteer themselves, but to their surprise, and to the surprise of everyone else in the arena area, they were beaten to the punch. I'll fight the two of you, came a voice from somewhere behind Tucker. The voice didn't sound loud enough to carry far, especially not over the sound of the excited spectators, yet it cut right through them like a 1,000 degree knife. The entire stands full of noisy spectators grew immediately silent. Tucker turned slowly to look across the arena at the source of the voice, and there stood a scrawny looking young man wearing a dark hoodie. He had the hood up, casting a shadow over his face. The mysterious challenger didn't look all too threatening, and yet Joe got a strange feeling from him. She wanted to protest the challenge, but she couldn't articulate why, and it wasn't as if Jen and Tucker couldn't take care of themselves anyway, so she said nothing. Jen jumped up onto the arena with Tucker, and looked the hooded young man over carefully. Okay, she said. Sure, if you really want to take both of us on, I guess Tucker can go first. If you beat him, then I'll fight- No, the young man interrupted. I want to fight both of you at once. 
Don't worry, he reassured them when he saw them exchange a concerned look. I know what I'm doing. I promise that as soon as I feel overwhelmed, I'll tap out. Something still felt off to Joe despite the young man's reassurances, but if Tucker felt it too, he chose to ignore it. He turned to Jen and shrugged, and she gave him a look that said, Okay, why not? The two of them turned to face their new opponent properly. As energy began to build between them, filling the air, signaling that the heart-to-heart -heart was about to start, a sudden, palpable cold spread throughout the room for just a moment, causing Joe to shudder. Joe couldn't be sure, but she got the impression that the sensation had come from the hooded young man. Her suspicions were confirmed when Eric announced the start of the heart-to-heart, -heart, and the young man shifted his head. A sliver of light passed over his mouth, and even from her place at the table more than 30 feet away, Joe could see his wide, cold smile. That same supernatural chill rolled off of him, carried upon a visible wave of crackling soul, and every one of the arena lights burned out all at once. At the same moment, the hooded young man seemed to disappear.